purposefully. Why don't I start again? 10 years ago in 2012, Wikipedia, together with many other websites, was purposefully made unavailable for one day. When trying to access Wikipedia that one day, you just saw a black screen with a disclaimer saying that Wikipedia was unavailable um, in order to raise awareness about two proposed US laws called SOPA and PIPA. If you don't know about SOPA and PIPA, um, then no worries. You will learn about it during this panel whose purpose is to look back at the events 10 years ago and to draw lessons from it for the future. And in fact, you have the best possible hope, host for guiding us all through the panel. And I'm not talking about myself, of course, I'm talking about Eric, Eric Möller. Eric is a freelance journalist, a software developer, and an author. He has a long history with Wikimedia. He started to be involved in 2001. A little reminder, 2001 is the year that Wikipedia was founded. So he is an early adopter, a very early adopter. And uh, so back in 2001, Eric got involved as both an editor and as a developer of MediaWiki, the software that Wikipedia runs on. He also gave Wikinews its initial momentum. Later on, uh, he became deputy director of the Wikimedia Foundation, where he stayed until 2015. And now he's freelance. Most important in the context of this panel is that Eric was one of the persons at Wikimedia, one of the key persons at Wikimedia during the blackout 10 years ago, which is why I said he's the best possible person to moderate the panel. And with that, Eric, over to you. Hey, uh, can folks hear me okay? Yes. Great. Uh, thank you for the intro. Uh, just to clarify, nowadays I'm uh, running engineering at uh, Freedom of the Press Foundation, uh, which is the uh, nonprofit that, um, uh, among other things, uh, manages the uh, secured uh, open source whistleblower platform and, of course, also advocates um, for uh, um, policies uh, that protect the free and open internet. Um, but yeah, uh, thank you uh, for the, the introduction and also uh, the summary of what we're going to talk about. Um, we don't just want to talk about what happened 10 years ago, um, but also um, what it means for uh, the moment we're in. Is uh, something like the success of the SOPA blackout repeatable uh, in the current moment, in the current technological and political environment, or is it not? Uh, and what legislative threats uh, are emerging today? With me to have this discussion, we have Corey Doctorow, uh, who is the author of a, a vast bibliography of uh, fiction and nonfiction alike. As an author, Corey has consistently advocated against copyright maximalism, uh, even uh, while folks have pretended uh, to speak on his behalf uh, in favor of copyright maximalism. Um, he is the author of nonfiction works that are very much relevant uh, to this discussion, such as uh, how to destroy surveillance capitalism and coming up uh, later this year, choke point capitalism, how big tech and big content captured creative labor markets and how we win them back. Uh, he's also a special advisor to the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Welcome, Corey. And uh, we have Tiffany, uh, Tiffany Cheng, uh, who is the uh, co-founder of uh, Fight for the Future. Um, without Fight for the Future, there would probably not have been a uh, super blackout. Uh, Fight for the Future was absolutely instrumental in helping organize uh, this grassroots campaign. Uh, she wrote and Tiffany wrote a, uh, an excellent analysis earlier this year, which I encourage you to check out. Uh, if someone could put a link to the chat, I, I would appreciate it. It's called uh, How the Sofa Blackout Happened on TechDirt. Um, so uh, take a look at that if you want to read a little bit more in, in detail than what we're going to be able to talk about uh, today. Uh, Tiffany was a uh, Shuttleworth and Ashoka Fellow at Fight for the Future. She's um, uh, helping run the A-Teams uh, initiative, uh, which I'm sure we'll talk about uh, here later today, as well as some of the ongoing um, campaigns at FTF. Welcome, Tiffany. Thanks. <clears throat> Uh, we also have Mishi Chowdhury. Uh, Mishi is a technology lawyer, uh, legal director at the uh, Software Freedom Law Center, uh, defending software freedom and online rights in, uh, in the United States and in India. Uh, welcome, Mishi. It's so great to have you. Um, so yeah, let, let's jump right in. Um, we can assume that some folks in the audience were still fairly young when uh, the super blackout happened. Uh, so I think it will be useful to just uh, start with uh, what was this legislation? Why was it such a big deal? Uh, why was it so important to mobilize uh, the free and open internet uh, against it? Um, I'm just going to actually kick it over here to Tiffany. Tiffany, do you want to talk a little bit about 
how this came uh, onto the radar for uh, Fight for the Future and why it was such a big deal. Sure. Uh, so there was this bill called SOPA, which had, by the time we looked at it, had gathered uh, around 90 co-sponsors. And it was the biggest piece of legislation uh, that um, Hollywood, MPAA, RIA, um, had spent, they had spent the most money that they've ever spent on one piece of legislation. And it was slated to passage. And this bill, uh, SOPA, or is also known as PIPA, um, would have made it possible for, for alleged or potential copyright holders to be able to say that there was infringing content on a website and be able to, um, outside of the courts, without having to prove it, uh, shut down an entire website by going to ISPs and, and there would be a process for that, but it would basically be an on and off switch and um, one that would shut down entire websites speech basically um, over a single piece of content or in an alleged way. So um, when it, it, it was obviously an overreach of legislation um, when you think about whether or not you should wake up to uh, the internet and see your favorite website go down. Uh, for no reason and um, without any sort of process around it. And uh, that was in the fall of 2010, it was slated to passage and it seemed like without a giant protest on the internet, this bill would have passed. And for the most part, all the tech companies, all the websites, uh, excuse me, I'm a little sick, but, um, we're going, we're, we, and policymakers were expecting this to pass, and but the internet decided we do something, and it it's significant because not only was this a maximalist piece of legislation that would have damaged the internet and all of the good things that we like about the internet, um, it was going to uh, just happen. And, but because the internet was able to organize and bring the threat to scale so quickly, um, this is the first piece of legislation that we've seen that actually killed such a, ex, you know, expected to be passed legislation with no opposition, mm -hmm. no previously op organized opposition um, in a matter of months. And so Congress was, um, completely surprised um, and so were we. I mean, it just didn't, we didn't think that we could so quickly uh, be able to organize like that. And that was, that was really what I think captured the imagination of people on all sides of the debate because it's pretty remarkable how powerful the internet can be when there's such a big threat. Um, so I hope that's a good intro. Uh, there are lots of things that happened, obviously, to make that happen, but it was significant. And Congress still, to this day, th they don't want to get sobered. And I think that is that it's still a watershed moment that uh, that you know we we have as a watermark for us to try to reach for the next time there is something that big again. Yeah, and one, one line that you um, used in your perspective really stayed with me, and that, that's the line, uh, lobbyists and legislators weren't allowed to think about anything else. Like uh, the wave of pressure uh, that came onto Congress, like it was really unprecedented, 10 million um, contacts uh, to representatives, to senators. Um, it was absolutely incredible. And uh, that was because the blackout wasn't just an internet blackout. It wasn't just we're taking down these websites. It was also like a mass mobilization campaign to contact your representative, to contact uh, legislators and tell them that this is, this is not okay. As, as I recall, uh, and Corey, um, I'd be curious if this, this reflects uh, your understanding of how this, this unfolded as well. As I recall, like basically folks assumed this was, this was gonna just pass. 
uh, everyone was kind of on autopilot, everyone was on board with this legislation in Congress. And then, whereas Tiffany said, like, uh, folks were taken by surprise by this, this blackout by this. Yeah, I think that's true. Um, I was in Washington, D.C. not long before the passage. And, you know, I'm not a, a Hill insider by any means. I'm, I'm much more of a outside the tent pissing in than inside the tent pissing out kind of guy. But I know a lot of those inside the tent pissing out types, people who are of goodwill, but who've been brought into the establishment. And universally, what they told me in the run up to the SOPA vote was that, um, you know, my brief when I left DC was to go home and think about what we would do in a post SOPA world, that organizing resistance was a waste of time. The, the fix was in, the votes were counted. And, you know, as, as Aaron Swartz told it, the, we knew the, the tide was changing when lawmakers who had sponsored the bill stood up on the floor to denounce it, which is always, <laughs> always a trip to have people telling you what a terrible idea those other people had when those other people includes themselves. Uh, and, you know, it, it, as, as Tiffany said, they couldn't think about anything else. Eight million phone calls were put through Congress's switchboard in 72 hours. And um, that made a significant impression. Michi, I'm, I'm curious in your own legal practice, how, uh, how, uh, what echoes did this, uh, this unprecedented blackout have um, for activism for your work uh, in India as well as in the United States when it comes to understanding uh, the impact of legislation when it comes to mobilizing resistance against bad legislation? Thank you. Um, I'm just awed that uh, with these people to be here with all of you who have done wonderful public things. But I must ask you to think of me as a person uh, who lawyers for people like them and sometimes I'm a scout who comes for a sporadic moment to keep them out of trouble. <laughs> and at other times I come along behind them trying to exploit um, the extraordinary opportunities their activism has created. But no matter what I do, whether I'm out ahead or coming up behind, uh, everything I'm gonna say today is going to seem less immediate and direct uh, because um, the activist's job is to be immediate and direct and make all these things happen as Corey and Tiffany have been talking about. And um, lawyer's job is just a lawyer's job. <laughs> so whether it's the clients I've represented in the past, such as the Free Software Foundation movement, which has had the DRM website, it has been running a variety of things um, the interesting bit is sometimes you get involved into by just, can you check, we are going to run this campaign and can you check the language kind of a thing? And then you get sucked into the details of it behind the scenes. So uh, what interestingly to me, it's um, the impact the entire movement here had, what the reverberations which the rest of the world heard. Um, in our own organization in India, I think the pivot became much clearer that how so many different stakeholders could join hands and then could actually change certain things. The fact that uh, internet.org, which was uh, free basics by Facebook, um, was uh, kicked out of India in 2015, had a lot of inspiration from what people were able to achieve at that point in time. And uh, uh, because um, there is no tech conversation, which will nowadays happen without Twitter or Elon Musk being mentioned in the past two weeks. I will say that uh, one interesting thing which stood out to me much later on was uh, that that time people talked about 2.4 million tweets were talked about this and even Mark Zuckerberg used Twitter to ask people to talk about this. But the most important bit there um, was, I will say, um, that the civil society was able to come together in different forms and make a point by turning the internet off, which in yeah. today's world is not going to be possible. <laughs> but what it spawned and what it inspired all around the world um, in terms of various other movements and how people started to view things um, that, was the mo that, that was the major point, that you could actually make a difference and make a change. 
even when the details are not clear. And a lot of times the people who are bringing this um, take it for granted that there's not going to be much which can come in its way uh, or have not even read, which how often happens, have not even read for what read what they're recommending. Um, but um, uh, to me, that's the most important bit about um, that civil society turned off a basic lifeline to make a point. Um, and um, uh, everyone else was watching because now the world has moved to a different uh, regime in terms of where the markets are. And the importance of what happened that is going to also determine what we will do in future. Yeah, and uh, just to get in there, I, I think we haven't explained what actually happened during the Soba blackout. And I think the free basics um, example you cite it, it is actually a uh, brings us back to it, which is, it was the first time that civil society groups, individuals, internet users in the millions, along with tech companies and websites actually worked together and were able to organize each other. Um, and that's, that's the part that the internet helps to bring to scale or make uh, accelerate to, to this, you know, two month mark um, that, actually made it so that the internet shut down for a day. And it was the internet blackout, the world's largest, or the history's largest online protest because um, all of these groups figured out how to work together because of a threat that was so large. Um, and I think the internet stood up to that challenge and obviously in that case won. And then Free Basics, which happened a few years later, we actually talked to them and they amazingly, and it's often really hard to harness the same kind of energy a few years later, but were able to harness a really, really similar energy um, using really similar tactics that we talked about and worked on with them. And it was incredible to see another moment where this could happen in, in such a big country. Um, so I think it, there, there's things we can talk about on why that worked and why that can't work again. But um, I think the, the fact that, that it happened, it's really hopeful. Yeah, to, to your point, Tiffany, um, I wanted to share a few examples of um, blacked out websites as well for those uh, who uh, didn't see it happen uh, in real time. Is the screen share coming through okay? Yeah. Um, so this is, of course, the, the Wikipedia um, blackout page. Uh, this is the version which had the uh, contact your representatives form on it, uh, which we uh, really put together at, at the last minute with the zip code uh, database to uh, look at your representatives fixing bugs um, uh, at the last minute to make sure that you're connected to the right uh, congressperson. Um, this was us um, at uh, Wikimedia Foundation uh, working in this uh, so-called war room uh, that we had set up uh, just to plan uh, the blackout very carefully. And it was a real blackout. I think that's important uh, to note. Uh, like, yes, you could work around it, but it was kind of troublesome uh, to work around it. You had to switch to the Molvo side, turn up JavaScript, prevent it from loading. Like, it was definitely not like just like, oh, it's a banner, I'll click it away. Like, it was really making it harder for you um, to get to uh, Wikipedia, which was a pretty big deal, which is a contrast with what uh, other websites were doing, like Google. Uh, and other big tech sites um, did more uh, symbolic things like putting a, a black bar on uh, the Google logo, which is of course very noticeable, but at the same time doesn't really prevent you from doing anything. Um, and then uh, you had like very big landing pages like uh, the Mozilla landing page, uh, just telling folks uh, to uh, take action against this uh, legislation, uh, wired blacking out, WordPress blacking out, uh, memes, of course. <laughs> What's so far? I should go look it up on Wikipedia. Oh, no. Um, and at the same time, there's, of course, the, the sharp contrast um, with uh, the, the big social media sites, uh, Twitter, uh, Facebook actually saying, we're not going to, to be part of this directly. Uh, yes, uh, Mark tweeted about it, uh, but there was no Facebook blackout. There was no Twitter blackout. Um, Google was one of the big tech firms that did uh, something, but again, it didn't go as far. And still, um, 
one thing that I think in this current environment is worth noting, like even then, uh, a lot of this grassroots energy against SOPA, um, folks tried to connect that with what big tech was doing and say like, oh, this is just big tech, like masquerading as and being a grassroots movement. In, in reality, it's just Google controlling these people and uh, telling them um, what to do. Um, so that was the, the SOPA blackout itself. Um, but then, uh, of course, uh, during the SOPA blackout, uh, I should say this as well, hundreds of thousands or over 100,000 individual websites um, blacked out. It wasn't just the big, big name websites. A lot of people uh, participate in forms big and small. But before that, uh, in uh, early in November, there was already a precursor to the SOPA blackout called American Censorship Day. Uh, Tiffany, can you talk a little bit about how that worked? Yeah, I mean, American Censorship Day was the first protest against SOPA that really seeded what became the uh, SOPA blackout on January 18th. And um, it came up, it, it was the idea of the protest. And that was what was significant because prior to American Censorship Day, uh, the opposition to SOPA was on you know, on blogs, in articles, um, and in petitions. And those are really, really important for educating and building the base, obviously. But realizing that you could use your website, you can take a tool, build a tool so that any website could join, use their property, and actually deny people access so that it was a real protest of if if Congress is going to do this, we're going to show how much it could, what this actually means and do something that matters where we have skin in the game. And that showed how much people actually care. Um, and I think, so, so American Censorship Day was the first time that the, this idea of what a protest could on the internet actually looks like, like a real has teeth protest looks like. Um, that's what American Censorship Day did. And it also, I think, really set, uh, said honestly what this bill was about. And it was, and we called it the first um, American censorship system. And if, if, if it were to pass, because it would be a way in which you could sort of on and off, um, turn, turn off websites. Um, and at that time, the big, uh, website that participated that we, you know, I think we all did a lot of organizing to make happen and to get this idea uh, to take hold, um, started with Boing Boing Corey and, um, and then we got to Tumblr uh, through, through all different channels of tons of people helping um, to make that happen, M making the policy case, making the legal case, making the activism case. And, um, so because of that, there were um, millions of contacts, 80,000 calls, Congress was surprised then too, um, but that's when the internet went ablaze on this issue. And from there, and um, Eric knows this well, um, there was a question, okay, we didn't kill this bill with American Censorship Day because that's just, that was just building towards what we really need to do is really make sure everybody on the internet sees this for one day and that's all they see. And that's the, that was the essential powerful idea behind the blackout. It's um, that actually ended up happening, but in those months it was organizing within the Wikimedia community because, uh, and, and lots of other communities, I think Craigslist and Reddit are also um, did as much as uh, Wikime Wikipedia, Wikimedia, um, but, it was those months of talking and thinking about what the stakes are, why one should do it, and really convincing each other. I think there was this, this amazing, if you saw it, and I don't know if it's ever, it's archived at all, the bottom-up discussion of why Wikipedia should do this that actually led to the final decision. That was hard work, and um, that's the kind of thing that once you, uh, that, that leads to big things like this. And I absolutely, uh, Wikipedia actually shutting down was one of the biggest reasons why SOPA died. 
um, without that, it would have, it would not be the same. Yeah, and huge, huge uh, credit goes to uh, Jimmy Wells for bringing that conversation to the English Wikipedia community, uh, stimulating lots, lots of debate there. And I uh, just cross-linked the uh, Wikipedia Zopa initiative uh, page on English Wikipedia. It is a huge page, so it might uh, slow down your browser considerably if you try to load it right now. Uh, just because of the sheer amount of uh, discussion uh, that, that took place in the community, but is very much um, leaning towards we must do something here like this is a big deal um what is super interesting on this page if you check it out today is like the depth of that discussion like it was definitely like a wikipedian discussion in the sense of like let's talk about like what this legislation really means like the wikimedia foundation general counsel at the time jeff brigham provided like a detailed legal analysis like these are the changes that congress has made to date uh, they are still not enough here's why it's still a big deal so it was a really informed and a rich discussion and, and the kind that you you rarely see in, in online activism. Tiffany, you, you pointed out something really important, which is this, this notion of individual websites participating. I think when we think about online protests today, often we talk about like social media hashtag campaigns, which is a very different thing. Like you're going through a corporate gatekeeper and saying, hey, we're gonna use your platform to mobilize against X or Y cause. Here, it was individual website owners who said, I'm going to take my website and enlist it in this cause. Uh, Corey, um, how did Boing Boing come to that decision to participate as like an example of a website uh, joining a cause like this? You know, I, I think that um, you, you've just come to the heart of the matter. And, you know, the answer to how did Boing Boing come to do it is, uh, it, it the, is very anodyne and it tells you, I think, what's changed because the way Boing Boing decided to do it is we decided there's four of us, we ran the website and we <laughs> said, this is wrong, we're going to do it. And, uh, you know, I, I, I've been doing this, I've just had my 20th anniversary with the Electronic Frontier Foundation. So I've been, I've been doing this for a long time. And when I think about SOPA, which is, which comes halfway through my activist career, it, it makes me think about what happened before and what happened after. And so the, I, one of my formative memories of internet activism after I joined EFF was the new royalty guidelines from the Copyright Arbitration Royalty Panel, the most bizarre and boring anodyne thing you can imagine, but it had enormous consequences. So CARP was a panel that the, was struck by the Copyright Office to figure out what it would cost to stream music on internet radio stations. And what they said when they sat down to do this is internet radio is already a thing, um, mostly thanks to Carl Malamud, who I think a lot of us know and love. Uh, and so we're just going to set like a, a dummy rate and then we're going to have this panel and we're going to meet with all the stakeholders and figure out the prices. And so during that period, that interregnum, a couple, three years at the start of the 2000s, there was this incredible outpouring of internet radio where like David Byrne had a station he broadcast from like his spare room of just stuff that he loved and everyone was doing it, teenagers, everyone. And then CARP met and they came up with a royalty rate that was so high that all of those stations shut down overnight, like bam, gone. And I was talking with someone from the record industry's policy side about this. And what they said is, we don't like having a bunch of people just able to set up and do what they want. What we want is to have like five companies in the industry, and then we will meet with them individually and we will negotiate a bespoke deal that's good for all of us, right? Well, that's what we've got now, right? We've got Spotify and Pandora and YouTube Music, Amazon Music, a couple more. And um, the record industry, for the most part, are big investors in those streamers. And they have over and over again, negotiated lower per stream royalties, the opposite of what they did back in the CARP days, lower per stream royalties, because when Spotify pays a lower royalty to the artists, they pay a higher dividend to their shareholders. And if you're Universal Music and you get a dividend, it goes to your shareholders. If you're Universal Music and you get a royalty, it goes to your workforce, it goes to the musicians. So this was a way of, engineers would call it impedance matching, right? Five giant record companies, five giant internet companies, they all sit down, they don't always agree, they're going to fight a lot about 
um, how many points should be shifted from this side of the balance sheet to that side, what music owns or entertainment owns and what tech owns and back and forth. But they want the same uh, kinds of negotiating policy because then you don't get these unquantifiable risks like tens of thousands of independently managed websites run by committees of four weirdos who say, oh, no, we're just going to black out our page because we don't like a piece of legislation. They can't even enumerate all the people who might do that, much less target them in any meaningful way. So right after CARP, there was a day when a piece of legislation very similar to SOPA was tabled in 50 state houses at once. And it was a very chaotic uh, piece of legislation and different names in different states. And it ended up not going anywhere in part because most of this copyright stuff is federal. But um, at the time, I remember colleagues at EFF being spitting mad because they were like, Microsoft is a giant monopolist and they can't even put a lobbyist in every state house. Like, what is the point of having a tech sector that's being corrupted by a giant monopolist if they can at least shake a few pennies loose from the back of the sofa cushions to have someone in all 50 state houses? Because we were like 12 people at the time. We weren't going to have people in 50 state houses watching this stuff. And we kind of got our wish, right? Now, Microsoft and the other tech platforms, they have basically come together and formed a cohesive bargaining block. And where we used to get together and say, okay, we're going to block out tens of thousands of websites in, in order to change Congress's mind. Now we say, we're going to black out our avatars to change an executive's mm -hmm. mind at a tech company in the hopes that they might go and change Congress's mind. And, you know, the thing we worried about in the days of SOPA was that you would have five record executives or six movie executives or five TV executives who would just have the power of life and death over entire websites, for, for, you know, what you might call it in ad tech, a vertical, right? Like the, the place where everyone gets their information about cars, say, would suddenly be uh, live or die based on the whims of an executive. And that's what we've got. Right. That is what we've got, because those independent websites effectively don't exist. And to the extent they exist, 100 percent of their revenue comes from an ad tech duopoly, Facebook and Google, who just unilaterally and opaquely make these choices. And and so we now have our our communications infrastructure being structured by unaccountable groups of individuals. And rather than being able to participate directly, all we do is sit on the sidelines and wonder whether Elon Musk is going to buy Twitter, right? And whether, whether Elon Musk will become God Emperor of Twitter, the way Mark Zuckerberg appointed himself God Emperor for life of 3 billion people's social lives. And I, I'm going to, I know I've been talking for a long time, but I want to end by saying uh, something that, that really made me change the way I thought about this stuff around 2003, 2004 which was I read a paper by Tim Wu, um, who was then a, a communications pro uh, professor and a protege of Larry Lessig's, uh, called Copyrights Communications Policy. And Tim was a scholar of um, monopoly and telecoms. And he said, you know, the telecoms industry, one of the reasons they're so powerful is not just that they're really concentrated, although that's really important because not a lot of people have to agree for the telecoms industry to have a common position, but they're just really cozy. Right. When, when, like, there's only four or five companies in an industry and they're all like, and, the, and it's been that way for several years. You know, if you're an exec at like Sprint, there's nowhere in the org chart for you to go up. And so you get like poached by AT&T and they make a box in the org chart. And then AT&T loses you back to Sprint, who makes a new box in the org chart to put you in because they'll do it when they're hiring an AT&T executive, but not promoting a Sprint executive. So you have people like John Legere, the, the, uh, uh, un-CEO of T-Mobile, right, who, you know, merged the company with, with Sprint, who said, you know, I'm not like any of these other people, and I'm not like any of the, and, and my company's not like any of these other companies. He was like an at and and Sprint executive before he was a T-Mobile executive, who then, like, d merged with those companies, right? It's, it's like, these aren't the Montagues and the Capulets, Right, like Sheryl Sandberg is not the bitter enemy of Google. Google and Facebook are not at each other's throat. Sheryl Sandberg's a senior Googler who is now the second most senior Facebooker. 
And, you know, like maybe the reason Bob Iger and, and Rupert Murdoch were able to merge Disney and Fox, those two great polar opposites of our media empires, uh, because they were star-crossed lovers who secretly yearned for one another, or maybe their differences were completely cosmetic. And they both agreed that what we really need is to have all of our industry structured by a couple, three great men, right? Like they basically got Ayn Rand brain worms. And, you know, it, that is, I think, become uh, what's become of our internet it, and, and our other industries. And I mentioned Tim Wu here. And the reason I mentioned Tim Wu is not because he's not just because he's an old friend. We went to elementary school together. We've known each other since we were shooting each other with crossbows in Dungeons and Dragons games when we were nine years old. But also because Tim is now in charge of tech antitrust at the White House. And we are living through a moment that I think gets lost in these discussions about copyright or harassment or, um, uh, you know, culture war stuff or policies about about censorship and so on which is that the, the the common thread between all of these is not that the people who run the internet have bad judgment although they assuredly do it's that there's a group of people who run the internet unaccountably and the most important thing that's going on in our politics right now is the change in antitrust law between lena khan at the ftc and Cantor at the D department of justice Wu in the White House, Vestager in the European Commission, the stuff that's going on with the Competition and Markets Authority in the UK, um, new thoughts about antitrust in China and India, all over the world. We are finally starting to talk about whether or not it is healthy for the nervous system of the 21st century to be presided over by a handful of unaccountable dorks who are no better or worse than you and me they're just like ordinary mediocrities who happen to lack the moral compass that prevents people from becoming monopolists and you know there are people on my side who say this is uh no good because what's really happening is the telecoms and entertainment companies are hoping to nerf the power of tech and that's totally true they are a hundred percent on this but they're making an incredibly stupid bargain or, or bet rather, you know, big telco and big content are betting that we can wake up the antitrust, gi antitrust giant for 40 years in a coma, get it to smash big tech, let them pick up the pieces and absorb it. And then it will go back to sleep. And the reality is that when we wake the antitrust sleeping giant from its coma, we will turn it against every one of those monopolies. And the way that we'll wake it from its coma is by having all the people are harmed by every kind of monopoly, the two companies that own all the beer and the four companies that do all the shipping and the one company that owns all the cheerleading uniforms. And, you know, you name it, it's all being organized under a handful of companies that are just as venal and corrupt and corrupting as the tech industry and as the entertainment industry. We're all going to make a coalition and we're going we're gonna to send that giant out to smash these other giants it will be the people's giant because we we are do ourselves an enormous disservice when we uh brief for say the tech giants to fight the entertainment giants because you know if they win they're not going to drop crumbs from their plates onto the floor for us all they're going to do is increase their own uh share of things we need a people's giant and i think we're on the verge of getting one yeah, so that is, I think, one of the the answers to like what is what is going to have to happen now in, in this current environment, and, and I'd love to explore what some of the other answers are in, in terms of like the the future of online activism, uh, as well as other ways that we can counter this uh, concentrated uh, monopoly power. Um, but before I, I go there. I did promise the panelists that um, we would take questions from the audience in between. And if there are questions from the audience that relate to specifically what happened uh, back in 2012, and that would be a great question to, a great point to uh, put one of those questions in, in between here. Isaac, do we have any uh, any questions that relate to the, the super blackout itself and what happened there? Yeah, thanks, Eric. We do a few. Um... The first one was uh, asking whether the panel could reflect on the question of who benefited and how uh, from the blackout. And the example is given, did Google participate because of the uh, do no evil um, or because there was a business interest? Um, in what ways was Google's interest 
different from Twitter and Facebook's interest who, as you mentioned, did not actually participate. Uh, just quickly, I, Google did benefit uh, and that's why they participated. Uh, but of course, when you align with that interest and you're fighting for the right answer for putting power, uh, dis distributing power, and I think it was still the right answer, then you can't help but when having people who are companies whose interests also align. But I think uh, whenever we're looking at policies, we're looking at policies about, that are structurally against arbitrary power uh, and for distributing and making sure and ensuring power is decentralized. So um, I, oftentimes that is the best way to figure out whether or not something is important and who benefits in the end. Not to say that Google hasn't uh, exploited that and also gained a lot of power outside of, or beyond that using all different kinds of methods, but we'll get to that and I'll let you ask questions. I said, do we have other questions? Yeah, the next one both has kind of a clarification piece, but I think there's a broader question to it as well. And the clarification piece, which was addressed a little bit in the notes document, is were visitors from outside the United States included in the blackout? Um, but I think the larger question there was, what was the reasoning for this? Um, was collateral damage minimized or international exposure somehow desirable here? It was definitely desirable to have uh, international exposure here. Like it was really a global moment. It was not a, a United States moment. And as, as Michi pointed out earlier, um, it, it was uh, something that had uh, echoes and rever reverberations like for policy discussions uh, that happened around the world. In fact, the, um, the silver blackout in, in uh, English Wikipedia uh, discussions about it uh, was directly informed by uh, a blackout that happened uh, on Italian Wikipedia um, a, a few months before related to a specific legislation. Um, so it was very much a, a moment uh, that wasn't uh, specific to the United States, but a, a point in time for the whole internet to say, this is a big deal because the consequences unavoidably would have been global. Do we have uh, other questions for the panel as well? Yeah, I think related to that, the uh, Italian blackout was also mentioned, um, but there is a question, I guess, Mishi, you had said um, such a blackout wouldn't be possible today. Um, and they were just looking for clarification as to why uh, you feel that way. Uh, thank you. Um, I think um, I, I just have to point it out that it was so successful uh, what people achieved in 2012 with the SOPA PIPA blackout, that the states, the governments all caught up with it. And now they turn off the internet to prevent people from making a point. So one of the things that has happened in this period is that internet shutdowns, which are the inverse of the black square days, have become a feature of the net. And because states, and governments are big and powerful. They are many and we are few. This has become more common than the protests. It was ultimately designed to co-opt. That's why I spend as much time in our organization tracking on internet shutdowns and worrying about government's attempt to keep people from making any points these days as I do in helping the people who try to use the net to make a point and are pressed upon the governments. Um, during the COVID years from 2020 till date, which are still COVID years, but um, government of India shut down internet 245 times. And this is the world's largest democracy. And um, um, uh, I live in two countries, which is the US and I was born in India and go back and forth. Uh, uh, but I have to say the future markets for all the companies are not here. They are in that part of the world now, um, which has 492 million WhatsApp users and um, 925 million 
feature phone users. So we haven't even gone to all the people who can be converted to smartphones. And the longest internet shutdown was 552 days of internet deprivation in Kashmir. And this is not an authoritarian government, this is a democratic government. That's why I say that you, yeah. And um, uh, that's why I say that what has happened, what could happen that time, it's not gonna happen now. It's also because um, uh, a point uh, which Corey was making is that the pathologies of politics and society in a platform world are becoming much more evident to the global population. And the attention is increasingly being focused on the oligopoly of platform companies, that they have too much power and they do. And uh, there is a time to be allies with them. And there is a time when you also have to grapple with where the power and the marriages lie. And the top-down structures of government control um, that is contemplated as responses to the power of these companies will only drive overprivileged management of these companies into marriages of brutal convenience with these post-truth politicians whose rise these companies have enabled. So um, that's why I say what could happen that time, we are living in a very different world right now. Um, and I don't want to say that uh, I am not uh, hopeful because there are a lot of good things also which can happen, but uh, any good activism or any good strategy begins with a proper assessment of what, the, what we are facing right now. And what we are facing is very different scenarios of different, uh, different worlds. Um, of all the people who they talked about, um, Europe does take the lead on regulation and they think that uh, regulation is how they can address these problems. And because US is the center of the world, um, they will keep on discussing these things till everybody comes home because innovation, 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 and China, 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 and uh, rest of the world, um, because um, policy moves not progressively towards a safer and more private digital society, but in destructive cycles of recurrent amnesia in which bad ideas are resurrected only to die again of the conflict between political mythology and technical reality. So um, uh, everyone else will keep copying all the bad ideas and say, you know what, the Americans are doing it, the Europeans are doing it, why can't we do it? And all the good ideas, they can completely and conveniently ignore because we don't have the same enforcement structures as the Europeans have. The Europeans don't have any companies to show for innovation. And uh, the recent actions have also told us that now Russia, China, Iran have their own internet. India, does, India can't even make up its mind, despite the fact that it is a democracy. It has all this educated young people who are not only the back end of these companies, but, are, but now leading these companies. And uh, all of us are still figuring it out whether our fights are going to be tinier and smaller or they're going to be larger and global in a way where the leadership may not come from the places we are used to for those to be coming from. Sorry, that was a very long-winded answer to one question about clarification. <laughs> That's all good, thank you. Thank you, Mishi. And, and, and we are getting close to, uh, to the next time that we have today, um, but I do wanna make sure that we and this is, in fact, a very good moment to do so. We, we talk about like the, the legislation that is actively under debate right now. And also uh, reflect on like what uh, has changed, like how, how do we need to counter this kind of legislation uh, today? So there, there are, of course, in the United States, uh, pieces of legislation that are uh, going to potentially harm the internet because they always are. <laughs> you know, like any moment in time, the last 10 years, you would have looked at it. Is there any pending legislation that would be bad for the internet? Yes, there is. But there's there's particularly bad pending legislation right now. There's the, the Earned Act, uh, which would uh, potentially harm or limit the ability of uh, you know, internet users to use end-to-end -end encryption. And then there's the, the Smart Copyright Act, uh, which you may have received an email from Fight for the Future today about uh, potentially uh, mobilizing online uh, protest against uh, that. Uh, specifically, when it comes to the Smart Copyright Act and uh, the campaign that Fight for the Future is organizing about that, uh, Tiffany, can you talk a little bit about that and 
also I, I would be curious um, in that context about your take on whether the the strategies of the super blackout are repeatable or not. Yeah, thanks. Yes, today is um, the day where we push back against the censorship filter bill, which is the SMART Act, as Eric mentioned. And uh, that's another on off switch that in some ways feels a little more similar to SOPA than other bills have felt or are, are shaped around um, because it actually makes it so that uh, any website, in particular small websites, will have to comply with um, installing a filter that would um, uh, sort of police and scan, scan uh, content and stop content from being uploaded before um, the world gets to assess whether or not it actually is uh, infringing material um, and, uh, and is not art itself. Um, so, uh, that and Wikimedia, I believe, is participating in helping to make sure that Congress is aware that the internet is here, still here. Internet users are here and paying attention and um, are looking for these giant scams. And the bigger the scam, uh, the bigger the outcry. And if it moves along, then I think the outcry will be even bigger. And I think that goes to what Corey and Misha were talking about. I think we're in a completely different stage of communications uh, where the internet went, the, during the days of SOPA, the internet was such that it was about preserving or making sure we have the opportunity for hundreds of thousands, millions of people to have websites or blogs or properties to talk, to express themselves um, and to make things and build things. Now we're in a stage, and, and, and I think that's why SOPA uh, had such a response. I think these days we're talking about an internet that makes people feel mostly conflicted about what side to be on because right now fighting for the internet also feels like you're just fighting for big tech, which makes no sense to most people and protest is blocking out your social media profile. And that doesn't quite feel like a real protest either. There is no damage um, that anyone really feels um, when that happens. So I think we're in a stage where when we talk about all of the problems and the media is, is so good at freaking out about this. And I think journalists have a responsibility here as well as the intelligentsia or whatever, um, that they focus on the harms within these um, plot on these platforms that are disproportionate in a disproportionate way to actually the scale of the problem. And um, I think it behooves all of us who have some privilege to think about what actually we should be working on and what will lead to a large scale response and reform or, or change for in the right direction of what is actually more harmful. And um, and not that those problems shouldn't be solved within their silos and that we obviously need more activism in general to sort of lift the veil of the narrative on disinformation and all of that stuff um, and censorship, et cetera. But we actually need people to, we need a dedicated group of people, groups of people who are actually thinking about the real, the larger scale harm, which is that governments and uh, monopolies are, uh, getting more and more powerful to the point where using data and in particular, uh, data and surveillance are synonymous in my mind. Um, so the more surveillance we're allowing to be installed um, and to exist, the greater the power of the most um, arbitrary, or most irresponsible and corrupt uh, institutions and players um, grow off of and historically are the major actors who actually do the most harmful things and uh, pit people against each other. So, you know, the minority group targeting in China, um, Russia shutting down protests. These are, these are giant harms that tilt the balance of the mechanisms that we have for uh, democracy towards these extremely, strong powers that once they get that much power, it's almost too hard uh, to fight. I mean, China is one of our biggest problems 
and um, and because of their surveillance apparatus. So uh, yeah, it's it's when we talk about where we are with the internet and whether or not we can have another blackout, it's what is the thing we actually should be fighting for that is has the gravity and scale and of an actual problem for humanity um, that it sets us off on the, on the wrong course. And I think when we, I think we're, everybody on this panel is uh, seeing a really similar problem or uh, agrees on where that scale is. And I think we're gonna get there. It's just, we spend too much time in the media focusing on or getting people to freak out <laughs> on things that will resolve humans work out and humans focus on uh, see problems where they focus and they fix them but there's a responsibility to think about and work towards the larger scale problems of actually giving that much surveillance and data and so and power to uh really unaccountable and large institutions Thank you so much, Tiffany, and, and thank you to all our, our panelists um, for this, this rich discussion. Um, I think the, the themes that have emerged here are, one, uh, this rise of unaccountable platform power and how we respond to it, um, both by fighting monopolies, uh, by breaking monopolies, and also, uh, frankly, by building uh, and re rebuilding uh, the free and open internet. Like the so-called blackout, as, as, as we pointed out here, was like a a unique moment in the history of the internet. And I really encourage everyone who is not that familiar with that history to study it because it is an important part of our, our collective record and our collective memory. But at the same time, as we've said here today, the, the landscape is changing, uh, the world is changing and we need to respond to the threats of today differently. Like whether it is by uh, directly joining a, a campaign to break up uh, tech giants or whether it is by um, making your social media uh, account on Mastodon as opposed to Twitter, like joining alternative platforms and helping them grow, nurturing back to health, uh, the free and decentralized internet that seems to be uh, slowly um, but gradually dying away. Um, you have some options for all of you to explore and uh, hope some of those points will come up uh, later again uh, today in, in the course of this event. Uh, thank you again all for joining us today. Thank you very much. It was great to see you all. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you for putting this together. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone, for this amazing, really amazing panel. Am I audible or should I turn off my video? I had some problems before. Great, thank you. So thanks, Eric. Thanks, Tiffany. Thanks, Corey. Thanks, Mishi. Um, for me, this was, I learned a lot and uh, I might not be the only one who feels a bit down <laughs> after this. Um, but thank you for for fighting um, for fighting for keeping the internet as good as it still is at least and making it even better. I was hopeful, just to be clear. And thanks for I keeping up the that. hope. Thanks, yeah. thanks for that. Um, but we, I guess, we anticipated a bit of this dynamic, and that's why, as a next point on the menu, we have more music. Um, so Ugne, welcome back.